Uh, normally we have huge difficulties. Um, Hi Dennis, can you hear me okay? It apparently is not the case this week. We can hear you perfectly, Andy. Welcome to the show. Great, because I've got, um, well, now I've got Skype on the iPhone, so uh, everything should be okay now. Okay, I um, hope you're all doing very well. Thank you for letting me on the uh, on the show. Um, so we've got DPR, Jones and Concordance, no Aaron Rar or Thunderfoot. Shame, really, because I had a few questions for them. They might have been able to give me um, a better uh, description or better answer, perhaps, but perhaps yourself or Concordance could. As um, inadequate as Concordance and I are, uh, we will do our best to help you, Andy. I'm sure. I'm sure you're going. I'm sure you're going to do fine. Um, basically, well, obviously, Dennis, you've seen my video um, I put up um, this week, saying that uh, atheists and evolutionists have have three unknowables. Um, and I have, I, I have seen it. I imagine the majority of the viewers, uh, whether watching live or on the um, videos that are subsequently posted on YouTube have not. Do you want to explain uh, briefly, if you can, yeah, what your okay. point is? Yes, I'll do that. Thank you, uh, Dennis. Um, basically, my video is about seven minutes long. Um, I talk about um, atheists and evolutionists, which they, they have three unknowables. And the three unknowables are uh, the Big Bang or the singularity, um, the primordial soup, and also uh, the first life form that which evolved out of this primordial soup. Now, as a theist myself, I do go on uh, to say that I have just one unknowable, which science obviously can't square the circle, and that is the the existence of God. Well, I haven't really got a problem with that because I take it by faith that that a God actually exists. Now, I've watched quite a few videos uh, on YouTube with Lawrence Krauss. Very interesting uh, man. He talks about something called quantum fluctuations. Uh, these are within protons and neutrons. Apparently, new protons and neutrons have something called quarks, three of them, which makes up about 1% of their mass. And the other 99% is made up of something called gluons. Now, the gluons are quantum fluctuations. Um, but these are, as I said, within protons and neutrons. So that would mean that protons and neutrons were present in the first place. And the question which I have, if this is true, then how did the protons and neutrons get there? Anyone care to try and answer that one for me, please? Well, before we do, um, what's your answer? Science cannot um, answer some questions. It deals with mainly the physical world around us. Yeah. Some things we've got to take by faith. So, right. So I, you're I, depending on faith to give you an answer. Yeah, what I, is what is the answer that your faith gives you? Well, I believe I'm not I'm not a Christian. I am a theist. I do believe that God exists. And therefore, I believe that somehow God did it. We don't know how he did it, but uh, I believe that God did it. I don't now, know. How. As I commented earlier on in the show, <clears throat> how is that in any way? helpful or explanatory it isn't thank it you isn't. at least you have the honesty to admit that well i i now, so I'll, we are now we are now both in the same position i imagine because i and i suspect concordance as well will say i do not know you say i do not know but i think god did it as i say you're just adding adding an extra shell to the unknown and it isn't an answer it's 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 useless as an answer as you've just accepted. Now I've got no problem with you believing yeah. in whatever you want to, but for you to come on and say, "Oh well, I think God did it," is it's just banal. Concordance. So Andy, let let's suppose there's a box and it's buried in. Uh, Beijing is, is buried in Beijing, some, someone's house in Beijing, some particular person, some particular house. There's a box buried 30 feet below the house. It, the box is one foot squared, all right? That's the size of the box. The box is made of cardboard and it's surrounded by dirt. Now, can you tell me, Andy, what's inside that box? Uh, I couldn't tell you. No, I couldn't tell Could you. Could you tell me if Bigfoot is inside the box? 
Well, I don't think he would, he would be able to fit in there, to be honest. Ah, so you can start to eliminate certain explanations for how things happen, even if you can't say definitively what is inside a box that you can't directly observe. Is that correct? Uh, absolutely, yes. I agree with that. So there are certain explanations we can eliminate because they are improbable or they are logically impossible. That's also correct. Well, it, see, this is the thing about science, you see. I mean, to, to know Ugh. something. It's no. a simple question. <clears throat> correct. Yes or no? Well, yes. Okay. So we can logically eliminate logically incoherent explanations. So if we come up with an explanation that is logically incoherent, we discard it. This is the process of science. We can't always know what's inside that box. And sometimes we can't directly observe it. We eliminate as many impossibilities as we can. Whatever remains, we sort through and find the most likely explanations. Why would there be a box buried at this location? What kind of objects would people have put in this box? What do we know about what people bury? What do we know about the world that we live in? That's how we arrive at possibilities. Eventually, we'll come down to a short list of five to ten things that we think are quite likely to be inside that one-foot squared box. But we eliminate the impossible, the super supernatural, the logically incoherent explanations as possible explanations for how things occurred. Now, if you want to believe that inside of that box is a tiny fairy, I'm not going to stop you because I can't prove one way or the other what is inside the box. But I will tell you that I find that logically incoherent, and I think there are much more likely explanations for how things came to be than the actions of a supernatural being. But, but... How can protons and neutrons be there all the time, or is there an existence all the time? And how did they get there? I mean, is it logical? I think that is a remarkably there? interesting question, and it is one that has puzzled the greatest minds. And I, I would put, be the first to put my hands up and say, I don't think that science has come up with a, um, an explanation that makes sense to me um, or is, is particularly persuasive. Uh, it's an unknown. But as I say, you... Uh, simply filling that gap of the unknown with your God does it not certainly points in the question. direction of a God, doesn't it, Dennis? No, it does not. It does not point in any direction. Which this direction? Is, sorry, let me let me just explain <laughs> what I'm talking about because I, I do want you to address this point. It's one that I was talking about earlier on in the show. The fact that science cannot answer a question does not mean that theism or a theist can come along and say, well, I win by default because I can fill that gap with my yes. imaginary friend. Explain to me how filling that gap for you actually, I mean, how, how do you think that that works? Well, because science can't answer the question, it certainly leaves the door open for theism, doesn't it? It for leaves God. the door open to all sorts of explanation, but your explanation including is God, worthless. Including some kind of creator. Okay, right. I'm saying your explanation is worthless. Fair enough. You no, have accepted that you do not know. But Dennis, Please, Andy, let me finish. You have accepted that you do not know how your God did it. So you have accepted that it's a worthless explanation. Well, look, if you, if you go by scripture, apparently what we read is that he spoke things into existence. That's one. That's what I don't know how that works. I haven't got a clue how that works. And also we, we read as well further odd, in the bible that uh, i think it's in job and, and this and this is something which we discovered back one in one moment think, andy if i may with let the red pick, one moment andy if i may let me pick up on one of the points that you made in your video and this is is a great demonstration of just how ridiculous your god of the gaps is or your argument that is you what? said in relation to the redshift and the uh, microwave radiation, background radiation. Yes. You quoted two uh, passages from the Bible, one about the God expanding the heavens, whatever, and the yes. second one, he spoke it into existence. Pause, there, pause there, please, Andy. Right, because my question is this. If your Bible and your God actually had any predictive capabilities or were, had any content of any merit, do you not think that someone prior to Hubble back in the late 1920s discovering the redshift may have looked at the Bible and said, oh yeah, actually, I reckon this prediction here 
when we find out when science can discover this it can show that the planets uh, that sorry the galaxies are expanding the universe is expanding the galaxies are moving away from each other no absolutely none of it until after the scientific discovery similarly with the microwave background radiation suddenly you come up with it oh yeah well actually it was in the bible all the time why is it only after science has made these discoveries that people come out with these predictions from the bible they're not predictions i'll tell you one thing i heard this week one second i have to get this in because i i heard an absolutely wonderful quote from ac Groening, and he said religion and science shared a common ancestor and that common ancestor was ignorance science has moved on religion has not yeah, I agree. Religion. Yeah, I agree. I don't I'm not religious myself. I have a very simple faith, like I've told you many times, a very simple faith. You've got faith in a deity that what created or started the Big Bang. I mean, what, tell me what you actually think, Andy. What did your God do and how did he do it? As I said, Dennis, I haven't got a clue how we done it. I, mean, I just take it by faith that somehow he spoke the world into existence. If he's some kind of a, a spiritual being and therefore he's interdimensional. Perhaps he created another dimension for us. I mean, I, I haven't got a clue, Dennis. I mean, I've been... Well, Andy, things like, I'm things sorry, like, I'm going to pick you up on this, because yeah. given the fact I saw your video and given the fact that you said in that video that you were going to be calling in, I actually uh, printed off the comments that you had posted on that video, your own comments. One, I will read to you. You state, how long do we need to try and prove something unprovable? What evidence would there be for any of the three I have mentioned? This is a bit I want to ask you about. You say there's a ton of evidence for God did it as well. What evidence? Well, if you look at the complexity of the universe, Dennis, I mean, how can something like that come from a so-called singularity or a Big Bang for a start? As I go on in my video, I do state that everything has complexity and design and order right from the vastness of the universe to this something so, so small as, as the single replicating cell now you can shake your head as much as you like dennis you, can, you can't get away from it what things are said in scripture and not only in the bible other places as well which predate 1929 i think the discoveries of 1929 validate what's written in the bible i don't think we can get away from that it's you say that... yourself in that video and i'll quote you again <clears throat> the bible is not the inerrant word of god it is the yeah. errant word of man so yeah. you can't rely on the bible by your own words andy yeah, some, and yes some i can shake my head it, and then. yes i will shake my head because you are talking absolute fucking bullshit I, uh, well, you can obviously think what you like, but at the end of the day, it stands. It stands. The, the expansion of the universe, we see this. We see it. It's empirical evidence. But that is not proof of your God, you fuckwit. <clears throat> oh, he hung up on us. And I never got a chance to say my next point. Go on, concordance. Let's see if we can encourage him to back up. If I promise not <laughs> what to I was going to say to Andy, we, I, might get, I already, we might get him back in. <laughs> I had already said it uh, earlier, but I have no commitment to the scientific theories that we use in science. None of us do. There's not a scientist out there who is not prepared to abandon entirely a scientific theory if its explanatory power fails. If a scientific theory like the Big Bang no longer explains the evidence, well, we throw it away. And, and talking about things like string theory or M theory, th those things are still anything, very... Tough. Anything to get away from a god. That's it with you the uh, atheists. No, anything Andy. To get away from no, god. no, no, no. So listen, look, you have... You, no, listen... You have no evidence for a Big Bang. I've already explained to you about quantum fluctuations. That's a load of crap. Something else, primordial soup. No evidence. The first life form from the primordial soup. No, no evidence. Andy, you no know the evidence. evidence. Let's, let's talk about Big Bang. No there is evidence. a. There, wait a minute, Andy. You have no evidence. I'm sorry. This is just bull crap. You just make up stuff. I mean, honestly, quantum fluctuate. You're going to trust a quantum fluctuation? 
18 billion years ago, which you've never ever seen before to make the whole universe something from nothing? Or am I going to trust a man 6,000 years ago called Jesus Christ, who got lots of documented evidence for? Andy, it's 2,000 <laughs> 2, years ago. 18 billion years ago. I'm sorry, guys. I'm going to say this. You are full of shit. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Andy. That was great. Thank you for your contribution. <laughs> so there we are. Uh, I.